Okay. All right. Welcome, everybody, to our uh, panel today. My name is Brad McLean. I'm a social scientist with NCWIT, which is the National Center for Women in IT. And I welcome you and am happy to see that you've attended this uh, panel discussion, which proves to be lively and spirited. Uh, I want to offer my thanks, as well as on behalf of all the panelists, to OpenStack, to the women of OpenStack, and to Nitya Ruff here for organizing this event, as well as a workshop that occurred earlier in the day. And to everyone else as well for coming, we thank you. This session is called The Diversity of Innovation, and our discussion today will focus on three major themes. Number one, unconscious bias. Number two, male allies and advocates of diversity and inclusion. And number three, intersectionality. We will hear about our panelists' ideas, some of their personal experiences regarding these issues. We'll summarize some facts and figures and research for you, and hopefully all of us will walk away with some concrete actions we can all take back home or in our organizations for all of us to become allies of inclusivity. I have some prepared questions that I'll be asking the panel, but we also will be welcoming audience questions as well. There are two microphones in the aisles, and if there is a question you'd like to ask, please jot it down. At the end, the final 10 or 15 minutes will be uh, an opportunity for you to ask your questions to the panelists as well. So let's set some ground rules first and frame the conversation, and then we'll introduce our panelists. First of all, diversity and inclusion. This is an everyone's issue, not a woman's issue. Second of all, women are not broken and do not need to be fixed. Number three, Men are not the enemy, quite the contrary, as we shall learn and hopefully is already evident to you by our panel makeup today. There are at least two cases to be made for diversity and inclusion in tech. The first is the social justice case. It's the right thing to do. 50% of our population is women, and their representation in tech among all industry sectors is a social justice issue. The second is the business case. We know that Innovation is closely tied to diversity. Diversity of life experiences, perspectives, opinions, functional diversity, all benefit business practices from innovation and creativity to productivity, efficiency, and the solving of complex problems, all important to the tech sector. And yet we have a big challenge in front of us. Since the mid-1980s, where we had 30 to 40% of the workforce in computer science represented by women, that number has been in steady decline for the last 25 or 30 years. Today, as we found out in the summer of 2014, when Silicon Valley released its numbers uh, in a spirit of data transparency, the numbers for participation in tech today hover around 13 to 20 percent, depending on the company. This at a time when the tech industry is at an all-time high for its influence and income as an industry. The sunlight shined on this issue in the press and with this data coming out has ushered forth a new era of uh, making this a priority issue amongst companies worldwide, not just in the United States. We know more about diversity and inclusion from a social science perspective than we've ever known before, and we know what to do about it. And so here we are today to actually confront these issues and discuss them as a panel. So with that, Framing of this discussion, some ground rules. Let me introduce my esteemed panel, who I should mention were nominated by their peers and the women of Op OpenStack to appear as male advocates and allies, or people interested in male advocacy and al allies uh, today on the panel. So I will introduce each panelist by reading a short bio and then ask them the following question. Why are you here on this panel today? Why do you care about this issue? And we'd like to start with Nitya Ruff of Sandisk Corporation. She is the director of SanDisk's Open Source Strategy Office, reports to SanDisk's CTO and Senior Vice President. She first glimpsed the power of open source while at a Silicon Graphics in the 90s and has been building bridges between hardware developers and the open source community ever since. Nitya is a well-known speaker and writer on open innovation, the power of collaboration and diversity in technology innovation. Nitya has been an advocate and a speaker for opening doors to new people in open source and technology in general, and has been promoting diverse ways of contributing, such as marketing, legal, and community. At SanDisk, she is also the president of SanDisk's Women Innovation Network, or WIN, dedicated to the development of women's highest potential in the workplace. She is a big believer 
that a company's diversity can strengthen a company's innovation agenda. Nitya, why are you here on this panel today? <laughs> I nominated myself. <laughs> <laughs> So that's why I'm here, I volunteered. No, seriously though, um, in tech in general, as you said, 75% of decision makers, 75% of the tech um, you know, workforce are men, and also in open source in particular, we have very few women in open source. So it's important that we work across men and women to uh, make sure that this is collaborative, inclusive, transparent, and a, a great place to be. And uh, my colleagues on the stage are great examples of people who strive every day to do that. So I wanted to join them. And the reason we're all here today, so thank you very much. Next up, we have Mark Mule, who is the Senior Vice President of Platform Technologies for Comcast. His team is responsible for building and running many of the technologies underpinning the products and services Comcast provides to consumers and businesses. He's the proud father of four and a passionate a passionate advocate of diversity and inclusion in general. Mark, why are you here on this panel today? Thanks, first of all, it's nice to be here. Thank you for the introduction. Thanks for putting this together. Uh, I hear, I'm here for mainly two reasons. Um, there's a lot to learn. It's an issue that really needs to be out in front of people. It needs to be a topic of conversation, I think probably in most companies and in most technical communities, OpenStack being you know, one that I care deeply about and one that I think can benefit from conversations like this. So I want to help bring this to the forefront of everyone's thinking. On a personal level, you mentioned I have four kids, and I am a proud father of, of four. Uh, very proud, just for the record. Three of them are women. Three of them will grow up to be women. Let me be clear, they're not women yet. They are, <laughs> they are six, eight, I have a son who's 11, and my eldest daughter is 13. And I love my job. And I love working on technical problems. And I, you know, I believe that software is eating the world, as, as Mark Andreessen has, has coined. And I want them to be able to have the, the viable option of working in the same field that I work in and be included and be valued. So for me, it's a very personal thing um, because my three daughters, I want them to feel like they can participate in that, in the ecosystem that I love so much. And very, very glad to have you here. Next, we have Dorian Neve of EMC Corporation. He is a senior director in EMC's Technology Alliances organization and is focused on building EMC's OpenStack partner ecosystem. Dorian has successfully led alliance efforts for some of EMC's most strategic relationships and is now concentrating on enabling third platform opportunities with key emerging partners. For nearly 20 years, Dorian's passion has been to address customer requirements through the formation and management of complex global relationships across a wide variety of industries. Dorian, why are you here on this panel today? Yeah. Thanks, Brad. Appreciate it. Um, you know, for a couple of reasons. Um, so again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I think this is a, an important issue, and I'm kind of proud to be part of it. Um, you know, first of all, you know, working for EMC, you, you think, you know, conservative, East Coast company. I've been there for 13 years and have seen it kind of evolve from a very conservative, sort of single-minded type of a company. And I think it's important to shed the light that even some of the more conservative companies, given the right kind of a focus, can make some dramatic changes in a short amount of time. And I've experienced that personally at EMC and wanted to share some of those experiences that I've seen and, and some of the steps that a big company can take uh, to really focus on something important, which, which we term as diversity and inclusion. Um, the second part is I've been in, involved in OpenStack for a few years now and I've been just really enjoying the meteoric growth and the, you know, and seeing what's happening there. I think it's a really exciting space and, um, you know, I think there's been some real tangible uh, metrics and benefits that companies get when they diversify and are very inclusionary. I mean, there's some, some real numbers that, are, that, uh, that I'll share with you a little bit later. Um, and companies are simply more successful. Uh, they're more innovative when they have a higher rates of inclusion of both women and, and min other minority groups. So I think that's another one. Um, and then finally, I mean, I'm, I'm a human being. Like, you know, like my colleague Mark, I mean, I've got daughters as well. Uh, and I think it's just, an, from, as you mentioned, a social issue that we all really need to focus on. Uh, and it's just, uh, I think uh, you, you commented on Maya Angelou said that the tapestry uh, of, of people together form one better uh, solution than just, you know, uh, uh, myopic view. So. So I'm here. Glad to have you as well. And we have Imad Susu from the Intel Corporation. 
He is Vice President of the Software and Services Group at Intel Corporation and General Manager of the Intel Open Source Technology Center, a position he's held since its founding in 2003. Susu is responsible for Intel's efforts in open source software across a wide range of technologies and market segments, including enterprise Linux and related technologies such as virtualization, data center, and cloud software, embedded market segments, and client Linux programs. The center also focuses on operating system stacks, including Android and Chrome OS for Intel architecture and Yocto, in addition to Linux kernel and related products user experience, and web HTML5 technologies on top of client operating systems. He sits on the board of directors at the OpenStack Foundation, as well as the OpenStack Foundation's diversity work group, and is on the advisory board for the core infrastructure initiative at the Linux Foundation. Imad, why are you here on this panel today? Well, I mean, not to mince word, I was told to be here, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so, um, but I wouldn't pass an opportunity to talk about uh, uh, diversity, obviously. I've, um, we at Intel have been, uh, um, uh, have, have had uh, quite a significant effort in, in diversity, and we've been very public about it, publishing all the numbers from uh, pay numbers to, um, uh, 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 to just the composition of employees and so on, and and not only women, women and underrepresented minorities in terms of you know uh, like in the U.S. African Americans, Hispanics, and so on. Um, uh, uh, personally, you know, in <clears throat> in my organization, the Open Source Group, it's a fairly large division at Intel, and uh, 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 with a uh, with a staff at least. Uh, uh, well, more than 50% of the OTC staff and more than 50% of the, the open source group engineers are managed by, you know, uh, uh, women leaders, whether women vice presidents and or women directors in, uh, in my group. And, um, and, and this is not something new. This is something that's been happening for over the past, you know, something like over 10 years now. And, and, and we view that as a key aspect and a key part of, um, you know, uh, uh, um, of having uh, really uh, uh, much of the innovative ideas and much of the uh, being a driving so f force for innovation within the company, uh, in large part uh, the result of the diversity in, in the organization. So, um, and I'm always honored to be, you know, uh, uh, it's really an honor to me to be selected or asked by, to be told by, uh, you know, the women of open source at Intel to like, hey, we want you to go do this. So happy to be here. Yeah, and we are honored to have you here. Okay, we're going to launch into our first questions. And again, the first topic is on unconscious bias. A little framing. Unconscious bias in the workplace has many disguises, many of you may be familiar with. Micro inequities or seemingly innocuous slights that compound over time to make the environment at work unwelcoming to women and minorities. Microaggressions along the same line. Personality penalties where being assertive might be interpreted as being pushy or bossy when coming from a woman. Stereotype and stereotype threat or the fear of reinforcing negative stereotypes about a group that you belong to. And more, unconscious bias is present in workplace practices recruiting, hiring, retaining, and advancing employees, often resulting in the disadvantaging of women and other underrepresented groups. What have been your experiences with unconscious bias in the workplace or that you have observed? Nitya, will you kick us off with this one? Absolutely. You know, the uh, tendency sometimes uh, from an unconscious bias perspective is to assume that the only woman in the room will take notes or will do the housekeeping for some, you know, and, and uh, do those kinds of jobs. And um, it's, it's a hard one to, uh, it's, it's basically stereotyping, isn't it? Or, or assuming things. Um, it, it's also quite uh, evident that uh, sometimes we tend to use those shortcuts or schemas or our view of people um, to assume that either they cannot travel on business because they have small children, or to assume that um, you know they have other things to do, and so they may not be interested in an opportunity or an assignment, and, and that kind of precludes them from being included. I was just going to build a little bit on that. I mean, <clears throat> it, it strikes me how those assumptions really pervade, and, and they come in so many different flavors. So um, there's the the common assumption that. 
uh, if you're a female, that you may be a project manager yes. or that you're involved in UI and UX design. We talked about that a little bit in the, in the conference earlier today. It, I enjoy walking around with some of my really great engineers that happen to be female and watch them you know, put people in their place yes. when that subtle bias starts to come out. Because it, I, I think as a, as a white male, it is, uh, I worry about what biases I carry with me. And I think everybody carries some biases with them. For me, it's a little bit about being conscious of them and, and putting, I don't know if controls is the right word, but maybe compensating practices in place to help offset some of those biases. Dorian, we're coming at you. Yep. Unconscious bias. Yeah, I, I think what, what uh, is fascinating to me is that some of the traits that are seen as favorable in, in men with, you know, being kind of more aggressive and, and maybe kind of steering or driving a conversation can be viewed in a negative light for, for women. So that make, they may come across as seeming pushy or overly aggressive or, and when, you know, so I think that's that dichotomy and that frankly, that, that, that sort of the negative way of looking at it, which needs to be kind of reevaluated. And I think we come in with those unconscious biases that need to be kind of re-looked at and, and questioned, frankly. You know, the, the other one is like some of their typical examples that I'll see is like, you know, who hasn't been on a, a phone call or in a meeting and the most extroverted person in the room or the loudest person in the room keeps talking and or talks over other people. And so if you are uh, innately a more, uh, you know, a, a more quiet person, a more introverted person, that person with more dominant personality is going to speak up. And again, I think that's something that we can we see every day in, uh, you know, examples of in our work environment. Imad, I know Intel has been involved in this for so long. And in fact, when Google released its uh, data in the summer of 2014, Intel is quick to point out, we've been doing this publicly for a decade. <laughs> um, are there, places, are there think, systems in place to address unconscious bias within yeah, the organization? Yeah, I think the key thing to understand about unconscious bias is that to recognize that it actually exists. And most people don't. And, and even if they do, they kind of like squint, well, you know, it really does exist. And there's been so many studies, you know, as recent as this past year. I think there is, uh, uh, and in, in, at, at all sorts of levels, there's this study where, uh, you know, they took the exact same resume, just changed the name, you know, African American sounding name and, you know, uh, just uh, uh, Anglo uh, sounding name and like, okay, how much, how many times have, which resume has been picked up and you see a huge difference between the two. So, and, and you just take this example and there's just many examples similar to this about just the very existence of the unconscious bias. So, so what I think the key thing to me is that, and the key thing at, at, at Intel, by the way, the way we struggled with is just to make sure that everybody understand that, yeah, yep, this is, is, it does exist and it's actually damaging. As you pointed out at first, you know, there is the, there's two aspects of uh, diversity and inclusion. Uh, there is the social justice aspect, and then there is a, an actual business, business benefit from it. And, there is actually, and the business benefit is actually significant. And again, there's been significant amount of studies that have been done about the, the, uh, uh, the benefits of having diverse staff and, and diverse uh, organization you know, at all levels, whether it's a group of a dozen engineers or, or an organization of a thousand people. So, um, so I think getting these facts out and, you know, having, you know, people in management, regardless of, you know, um, whether they're male or female or African American or whatever they are, but having all of these people actually really understand that, that there is actual damage done when you are not, you know, uh, uh, when you're not internalizing and, and aware in the back of your mind, like, yep, you know, I may have, you know, uh, unconscious bias about these things, I mean, you know, and those type of things. So I think recognizing it is really important. Uh, absolutely. And uh, being a social scientist, I should point out, there's been some new studies that have come out in the last two years showing that companies that um, educate their employees about unconscious bias or diversity and inclusion and then check the box off and, and say, okay, call it a day. Um, that these one-shot deals, these one-shot trainings to, to result, do not result in changes. Unconscious bias raising to a conscious level is not accomplished with just a, a meeting or a, a workshop. Yeah, what kinds of steps have you seen or experienced um, that take it to the next level? What's required after the unconscious bias conversation has been started? You know, um, I, I think all of these panelists said it. 
uh, first of all, uh, you've got to have leaders at the top who believe that this is a change that they want to invest in, that they want to make, and that uh, the company is committed to it at all levels. And, and in the case of OpenStack Foundation, um, the diversity task force, which reports into the board and is part of the board, acknowledged the fact that not only in technology uh, is OpenStack diverse, you know, we, we need to coexist with lots of different kinds of clouds, but even the people of open source uh, and OpenStack need to collaborate across different companies, different ecosystem, different projects. And, and if we don't have everyone engaged, um, then we don't have a successful project. So I think that the, it, it needs to start from the top. And then, uh, frankly, the second aspect of it is, and why these leaders are here, is leaders need to role model that behavior and a need to have a zero tolerance on bias and uh, need to demonstrate that that, that is not accepted. Um, and, and those are the two things to me which really reinforce beyond the training, you know, what should happen. Some of the, some of the most progressive companies we've seen actually measure their progress, treating this uh, diversity and inclusion challenge like any other project. Um, have you seen any uh, or been part of any efforts that include? measurements of progress or descriptions? How do we know if we're making a difference? Yeah, I'll take a stab at that. So, um, you know, certainly at, at, uh, at EMC, what, what we're doing is some, some tangible steps. And I think it was actually based on, I think, the two factors you mentioned. There's a business aspect, and there's certainly a moral and, and social obligation as well. Um, from a business aspect, um, you know, there was a study done by Catalyst, which, which I'm sure we can share with everybody, that companies that employed a higher percentage of women, I think they were looking at greater than 24, 25% women in those companies were more profitable, had a higher return on investment, and were more innovative, right? And so I think there's, you know, you're looking for that business rationalization, which, you know, big companies always, uh, always look for that. There's some real tangible evidence that that occurred. So I think that that's one start, and that helps the leadership understand the importance of diversity and inclusion, and develop the programs around it. So again, at EMC, CEO level commitment to diversity and inclusion, including one of his top five uh, goals for the year is to become one of the top 10 uh, companies in, in the world around you know, that focus on diversity. Has a department set up specifically with a chief diversity uh, officer and a whole department with, uh, with work streams, with education, with circles for the different, um, you know, different, different people who want to join and really understand you know, what it means. So it's, it's raising a level of consciousness, it's getting executive commitment, and then with that comes that uh, you know, courage for both, both sides of the equation to step up, uh, feel in a comfortable and safe environment to really participate. Let me build on that a little bit. As a, as a consumer-oriented company, um, you know, Comcast tends to think of this problem uh, beyond just the four walls of the workplace. So um, I, I think it's pretty well understood that uh, economic disadvantage disproportionately affects underrepresented parts of the population. And so Comcast, for example, has an Internet Essentials program that's meant to help bridge the digital divide for those underprivileged homes that can use some help, give them access to the Internet, the same kinds of tools that uh, you know, other parts of the community have access to. Then you have, um, you know, a, a, you develop a pipeline of, of people that have access to the same infrastructure, the same same information and, and societal benefits. Then you have, uh, you know, in my case, daughters and sons that are in uh, grade school. And uh, I happen to believe that if you don't get people interested in science and technology early, um, it's it's pretty easy for kids to sort of close their minds to, to that adventure. Uh, so Comcast is, in fact, this weekend, uh, one of the programs that Comcast is heavily involved in, the FIRST Robotics program, has their national competition. I think it's in St. Louis this weekend. So we have a number of Comcast-sponsored teams where we help schools um, D develop their teams. They're, it's, it's like a small startup. These are, you know, grade school and high school kids that are essentially running a small startup, doing their own fundraising, having a chief marketing officer. You know, they do all the stuff that's necessary to essentially culminate in this robot in a competition and trying to win, uh, you, you know, this competition that's in St. Louis. Uh, and then you have to get people into the employment pipeline, keep them at the company, and 
uh, you know, that's, that's, it's not a, it's not a one time, it's not a one time thing or something that can only happen in a segment of someone's life. I think it starts way back when they're young. Yeah, Mark brings up a good point. Uh, oftentimes the attention for diversity and inclusion is focused on the pipeline. If we can only get more girls or minorities into it, encouraging them through uh, grade school and into the career, uh, high school, major in college, into the career, we'll solve these problems. It's not enough. It's not enough, as we say. And that brings a perfect segue. It's, but it's essential at the same time. It's not enough, but we have to have it. Uh, a perfect segue to our next question, which has to do with the environment that uh, the workforce that's waiting for them it's going to be like. And male advocates and allies is a, is a new one. Let me frame this one up a little bit and then pose a question to the group. Earlier this year, NCWIT, which is my organization, released a new toolkit for companies and change leaders within them to launch male advocates and allies programs. Uh, it's a topic which has been gaining momentum over the past several years as an effective way to address unconscious bias and change the environments within workplaces. There are several questions that I want to ask about this, uh, but first let's start with a generic one. What have been your experiences with male advocacy? Now, I'm asking male advocates a lot, except for you, Nadia, of course. Yeah, uh, what have been your experiences with it? But um, are your companies moving out on an industry uh, enterprise level uh, initiative with male advocacy? Is it more of an individual choice? Um, have you seen successes? Have you seen challenges? Uh, yeah, I mean, um yeah, we, I mean, at Intel, we've, we've had male advocacy program for a while, and, and it, it, it does work. And, um, but I, I, um, I want to go back to the previous topic, if you would allow me, just, just one quick comment about, like, what should companies do and so on. And, and I think the first thing, and one of probably the most important thing, is establishing and publishing metrics publicly. Yeah. You know, and because if you do not do that, it's very, very difficult to see if you're making progress. And if you're not accountable to your customers and shareholders and to the public, then it's just like there is nothing really holding you back. So, uh, but back to your uh, male advocacy, yeah, I mean, it's, it absolutely works. It's you know it exists at Intel, you know, um, and uh, uh, but it's I mean but there is more to it. I mean I, I think um, um, my reluctance usually from uh, these type of programs is that they they could be used as well. There is this program and this program, and it's really everybody's responsibility. And you know so that's why the continuous education and you know having the metrics and publishing those metrics is really what really you know moves the moves the ball forward on on this. I was just going to mention that. Uh, I don't think we have a program labeled male advocacy, but I think I understand uh, the concept. And for me, um, I, I've appreciated the problem of, in particular, gender underrepresentation uh, in the organizations that I've run. So I try to go and take you know, special steps to ensure that whenever there's an organizational structure change or whenever there's an economic impact on employees' compensation, that I do sort of a second level of review to make sure that the right kind of thought, unbiased thought, has gone into the planning of those changes. Um, yeah, that's a, just a tangible, real-world thing that I, as somebody in a position of power, can influence directly without a big program, without a lot of support from the organization. We have parts of our team that experiment with the double-blind resume, where you have a, an, an, an anonymized resume that gets sent around to figure out you know, whether we want to bring someone in for, a, for an in-person interview. We haven't figured out how to anonymize the in-person interview yet, uh, but maybe someone more innovative than I can, can come up with that idea. No, that, that's excellent. I, I, you know, in, in our work at NCWIT, as social scientists, we're finding that the most successful male advocacy programs aren't advocating for individual women. Rather, they advocate for an environment that's inclusive and benefits men as well as women. And incidentally, Mark, I heard on NPR, maybe some of you as well, there is a company, an innovative company out there, working to anonymize interviews by giving the, the CIA protected witness interview person. The, the funny thing was, though, when they distort the person's voice, it's distorted to sound like a man's. <laughs> so there could be some room for, for input there. But what, do, what are the kinds of things that you've seen or done yourself that male advocates do that um, seem to be effective or promising? 
and I'll ask the opposite question at the same time. Are there any things you've seen male advocates do that were really the wrong choice? Because we can learn from those kinds of things as well. What do they do effectively? What do they do that's not effective? Can, can I uh, comment on a couple of people that are my favorite advocates in, in the company? And, and very often what happens is there are many, many well-intentioned men, very well-intentioned managers who want to get involved, but very often they don't know what to do. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough situation because they don't want to appear to kind of uh, rescue you or dive catch, but at the same time, they want to speak up for you uh, and, and, and do something about it. So, so when we created the Women's Innovation Network Board at SanDisk, we specifically made sure that we had men on the board as much as uh, we had women because we wanted to hear their perspectives. And they wanted to, they both expressed a desire to understand, walk in our shoes, understand what we go through at work. And then, and, and they speak up for us in, in meetings and behind closed doors and champion the cause. Uh, and, and somehow, because um, they're coming from a different perspective and they are in meetings where we are not, uh, we are able to get much more coverage of the issue than uh, we normally would have. And one last point, um, I'm so proud of this, and I know a number of the women of OpenStack are here. From a metrics perspective, we've really improved the metrics of uh, OpenStack. We were at 11% women at the OpenStack show in Japan, and today we are at 12% for this show, and we've come a long way. I think it used to be 5 6% uh, at OpenStack, so that's huge that's metrics and progress. huge progress, yeah. Male advocates and what they do. Um, when we look at, at uh, successful strategies in, in a researchy way, we're looking at the impacts of their uh, advocacy uh, in terms of um, retention, of course, the head count, how many women are retained, in which divisions, how many women are promoted. Um, but are there are other ways that uh, the environment has changed beyond the numbers you know, that male advocates can really advocate for. We found some evidence this is related to why people are male advocates. And you guys said earlier why you are on this panel. Uh, but have you had any experience with, with other men? Why are they choosing to become, you know, uh, most diversity panels that I've sat on don't include so many white guys sitting <laughs> up here, you know? I think it's encouraging that it does because yeah. it's a symbol that, uh, that this is being supported and it's an everyone's issue, not a women's issue. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll take that one. I think, you know, for me personally, I think uh, it's an important issue to me personally, I'd say personally and professionally. I think uh, from a professional level, I've had some, some uh, excellent male and female mentors to, uh, and, and folks that have provided guidance to me and I think have set a good example. Uh, in fact, in my direct chain of command, a very strong uh, female uh, leader who has really kind of exemplified what, it, what I think it means to be a strong leader in a large company. And so I've sort of tried to model some of my behavior off of her. From a personal level also, you know, again, commenting about the daughters, I think for me it even spans back to, to my grandmother who was a Holocaust survivor and, and you know, had that, that optimism and strength to survive during that kind of, a, of an experience and actually even uh, you know, gave birth to my mother in a, in a concentration camp. So that kind of strength and um, fortitude carried over to her and her life. And, and I'm seeing it in my daughters. And so I want to kind of continue projecting that positive image of optimism and strength and perseverance and sort of the ability to, to go through anything. My, my, young, my oldest daughter has Crohn's uh, disease right now. And so I'm seeing her kind of struggle with some of the same um, uh, issues of how do I how do I stay strong and positive and all this and and yet I can also see kind of that genetic lineage you know occurring and her strength in it so um, for me it's a both personal and professional and I think um, it's something that as I try to either mentor or sponsor or just be a sounding board for any of my colleagues whether they be male or female or, or for other minorities just to be that that open-minded ear and help guide them particularly if they are uncertain of themselves given you know some of the unconscious biases that we're talking about. Um, so yeah, I, I try to provide that. Uh, and and, re and the other thing is recognition. I think yes. recognize, recognizing for the sake of their own work, not necessarily taking credit for work that someone's done for you or around you and are being compelled to uh, ensure that they're getting the, the recognition they deserve, um, whether they're getting it or not, I think is important. 
Um, Nitya, you've got the unique experience here. Have you ever been uh, witness to or experienced personally the uh, benefits or the opposite, some downfalls, of male advocacy efforts that uh, have succeeded or, or not? Absolutely. Um, I think there are, there are two or three examples I can think of. One was, um, so there, there was this person in our team, this man who was leaving early, and uh, so the boss said to him, uh, why are you leaving early? And he said, uh, to go pick up the kids. And so his boss says to him, um, isn't that your wife's job to do that? And we were all kind of really shocked that, that he said this, but we didn't know how to call him on it. And, and interestingly enough, another male colleague called him on it and said, come on, guys. This is you know, 2016, and we all are parents, and we all have responsibilities to go pick up our kids. And I'm glad he did that because that really changed completely the perception of uh, you know, this manager and how he behaved. And, uh, and in a way that benefits It benefited men everyone. As well as, yeah, yeah everybody. exactly. Yeah. So that's, that's a great example. And, and the other example is just one of my colleagues going to Grace Hopper and then being surrounded by you know, 7,000 women yeah. and, and really experiencing what it feels like to, for a woman to be in a tech conference and uh, you know, experiencing the opposite and walking in our shoes and, and really immersing himself in um, the issues that we care about. Yeah. Yeah. Having uh, men, white men, increasingly Asian men in the tech sector, uh, opportunities to have experiences themselves as a minority is a strategy some companies use in simulation or in other ways to try and get them to, to have personal insights into these kinds of things. So uh, very effective. We have around 15 minutes left before we're opening it up for uh, audience questions. So keep your questions in mind if you've got some. And I want to shift gears only slightly to the topic of intersectionality, which has to do with uh, male advocacy, of course, and unconscious bias. Let me frame this one up a little bit. Um, intersectionality is a term we've increasingly become familiar with through uh, uh, the press and certainly through the blogs in the uh, industry. Um, it is the idea that we are each of us a uh, plurality. We all have multiple identities. As I like to point out, this is not a disorder. This is normal human behavior. We have different identities and often we are told to bring our best self to work. And those companies that realize we need to bring our best selves to work are the ones that are more inclusive. They are the ones that recognize that each of us have different roles, different hats that we wear in life. How do we activate intersectionality? How do we use it to our advantage to increase diversity, innovation, the things we've been talking about? How do we use it to confront unconscious bias? And I'll, I'll mention one other thing. We know that employees, employers and employees who occupy more than one minority category for example, being a woman and being African-American, or being a woman and being Hispanic, confronts them with multiple biases, right? They are compounded. And so these people are even more underrepresented in our industry, in tech, as well as in other industries. Their challenges are compounded. Are there any special programs, initiatives, or experiences that you've had that address multiple biases or the idea of intersectionality? That's Mark? A that's a tough one. I'm I sure. know, I just saved it for last. I I'm not sure I can cite one that I'm, I'm familiar with. You guys? So, go ahead. I mean, I know individuals who you know, happen to be a Hispanic woman and so on, but uh, um, yeah, I, I, you know, um, I, I, the way you, I mean, my personal experience is what you said is a bit overstated. Please. I think I think the uh, my experience has been is that the, there tends to be an overwhelming uh, uh, one overwhelming single bias, you know. So, for example, in, in any specific environment. Uh, so, let's say um, you know uh, ten engineers and you know nine males, one female. The, it, the, the male female becomes the bias versus you know. Um, uh, Hispan one Hispanic versus, you know, and so on. But I think typically it is, there is one overpowering bias. I haven't, I haven't, I can't, I can't remember 
like what it, something like this would look like, maybe? I mean, the, the closest I think that we have is that we created this concept of circles, mm -hmm. right? And so there's a, there's a women's circle, we, and there's, I think at EMC we have something like 12 or 15 different circles. And so there, there are specific minority groups, circles for them. So there's probably intersections within those, I'm assuming. Yes, um, yes. I've, I've attended a couple of them. So that's probably the closest thing that we have to, to something that probably addresses intersectionality. Because I'm assuming some of those discussions probably range across those. Yes, absolutely. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, while well, we have 15 to 20 percent of the technical workforce currently occupied by women, um, if you look at women who are also black or Hispanic, that number drops to around 4 percent. So clearly there's an issue of multiple biases there. It may be that there's an overriding bias that it's gender related. Compounded. Yes, please explain but, what but you but mean. It, yeah, but, but I don't think, I mean, this becomes a, a statistical issue. Yes, no, no, yes. Not really. It's just a compounded problem. Yes. You know, I mean, yes. you just happen to be a woman and happen to be yeah. uh, African American. You're like, okay, so, um, uh, but I don't yes. think it's, uh, it's specific to like an African American woman by itself brings up. Maybe it does. I, I'm not sure. I, it I, doesn't I, strike me. Though. At the end of the day, you've got to listen, you've got to understand and walk in their shoes. And, and then see what, what are the biases that they face and solve for that as an organization. And a solution isn't going to necessarily be targeted at any particular subcategory or group. It, that's right. why I think the, the solution is an environmental solution, yeah. an environment of inclusion, an environment that supports diversity, right. as opposed to, as you said, trying to support individuals right. or right. perhaps small groups. Well, tying it back to our male advocacy thing I'm, uh, and, and male advocates who are in the room today, uh, what is it that male advocates need to know to support that kind of environment? What do they need to know about intersectionality or any of the other things? How do we prepare? They have the desire, right? They've motivated professionally or per personally, as Dorian pointed out, to become male advocates. But what do they need to know? Is intersectionality part of that or is there other priorities to help them be successful? I, I know we are running out of time because we, we have to wrap up uh, and it's 520. So uh, I think the, the most, the best thing we can do is to give them practical steps that they can take in everyday situations, especially managers, because the manager-employee relationship is the most important. So things like how to run a most effective meeting, how to prevent interruptions, how to prevent someone from stealing ideas or not acknowledging the other person, or how to pull out a quiet person in the room uh, and, and have them being included in the conversation. Mm -hmm. so I'd say practical steps that they can take in everyday meetings and promotional discussions and recruitment, et cetera, yes. uh, would, would be the, the right thing to do. Right. Did we have an audience question? Please step to yes. a microphone. Yes. Just one last question. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. You're over time. So Michael Schultz with uh, Microsoft. First of all, thank you for having this conversation. It's great. Actually, give it up for these guys. Okay. But while it is great that we are talking about uh, diversity and inclusion, and I somewhat see it sometimes interchanged as being the same. Well, one is being invited to the party, the other one is being asked to dance. Yes. What I'm a bit concerned about is that it oftentimes, what I see more and more is in this conversation, we're stopping at gender. We may include race. Where is the conversation about disability? People with disabilities are not really included in this conversation. So what are your thoughts about that? Uh, ageism as well? Yes. Yes, there are a number of factors that we have not yet addressed with the same uh, yeah. uh, amount of sunlight as we have with the gender issue. And yet the psychological phenomena in play are often similar. Any comments from the panel? No, I mean, I talked, I mean, yeah. I, think I, it's, I kept talking about like, I think uh, it Hispanics starts, and yeah. African Americans. I think yeah. it's, yeah, I, I completely it, agree with it you. It is the big D, it's the big I. Absolutely. That's what we're all aiming towards. Uh, it's creating the big tent where everyone is included, everyone is valued, everyone's contribution is appreciated. That's what we're aiming for. The, the biggest constituency that, that we wanted to attack first, uh, at least this panel wanted to look at, was gender diversity because we're 50-50. But then we have to go beyond that. Uh, I think attacking gender diversity also really lifts all boats, frankly, and it creates a better environment for all cultures and, and uh, handicap and other uh, areas as well. I think this hits to the heart of intersectionality because we're talking about the ways we differ 
and an environment, as Mark points out, that supports those differences and embraces them is what we're all after. My thanks to each of our panelists, to our audience, and those of you who just got the snippet at the end. Thank you for coming, and have a great conference. Thank you. Thank you.